Um, right, so I'm going to just start the live stream now. So uh, yeah, this is the, the effect handler session, which uh, I'm very pleased to actually be at. Um, so the first talk is going to be given by Casper um, on staging of effects and handlers. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, so actually this is more about um, how we can implement staging as an effect. Um, and the confusion is perhaps in the title because we called our paper, short paper staged effects and handlers for modular languages with abstraction. Uh, one of the reviewers of our paper uh, also remarked that our use of staging is, is not quite standard. So actually the first thing that I would like to do is, is to rename uh, the title of, of the talk at least to latent effects and handlers for modular languages with abstraction. Um, because yeah, uh, for reasons that, that should become clear uh, during the talk. So this is joint work together with uh, Kas Madarest and uh, Tom Schreibers. The motivation for this work is to define modular languages. Um, so here I've, I've uh, we have a box which represents a language. In this case, it's a, it's a state language. Uh, and it's a language definition which has a denotation function which associates expressions to computations where computations are given by some monad M. Um, and well, the denotation function associates expressions to computations that yield values. So we have a type of expressions, a type of values, and then some computation M, which has two, at least two effects defined for it. We have a put operation and we have a get operation. And uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to define languages that have effect in a modular way, um, effects such as state, but also effects such as functions. Uh, so over here, I have a, another language fragment, um, which has now, in addition to, well, it has, again, a denotation function, which associates expressions to uh, computations that yield values. But now we have a different set of operations for this language over here. We have an abstraction operation, which takes a name. Uh, so it binds a name, and it, it uh, takes a computation for constructing the body of the value, uh, the body of the abstraction. We have a fetch operation for looking up a, a, a named variable. We have an apply operation for applying a function to an argument. What we would like to do is we would like to define these languages separately and then compose them. And um, a key challenge here is, is, well, we would like to compose the set of effects that uh, these two languages have. So we would like to end up with a language that has both the put, put and get effects of the state full language uh, but also the uh, abstractions, fetch and apply operations of the function uh, of the functional language. And furthermore, we would like to have um, this language composition operation be well behaved, meaning we would like for it to be associative and commutative. So we don't we want uh, we want we don't want order to matter when we compose these two uh, different languages. Um, so this is the motivation. Uh, this is what we want to support. This is why we started looking at, uh, at these latent effects uh, that I will be talking about. Um, so by extension of the desirable property that I list on this slide, that we don't want order to matter. We also want effect composition to be associative and commutative. And this actually already gives us, um, well, if, if we look at um, the state of the art in defining modular effects, if we want to have a notion of effect composition that is associative and commutative, at least if we want to just compose the effect interfaces, then um, with mono transformers, um, the order generally matters when you compose uh, mono transformers, you get uh, a different semantics depending on the order in which you, you compose, you would compose your, your language fragments if you were to use mono transformers. On the other hand, with algebraic effects, uh, they have a very nice composition a property that you can um, you can uh, compose effect interfaces in any order you want, and it's associative and commutative. So, 
this is just one of the nice effects. Um, yeah, well, so the nice effect here being that we compose effect interfaces in a way that is commutative and associative. Uh, more generally, if we have an effect uh, interface that is described by an M1, we can always add more effects in a way that, um, yeah, uh, to, to this effect interface. Um, so I've said that we can compose effect interfaces in a way that it's commutative and associative, but actually if we want to, with algebraic effects, we all have to then subsequently assign meaning to the sets of effects that we declare our program has. And uh, the way that we assign meaning is by mean of if, means of effect handlers. So here I have a, the type of a handle function, which takes uh, handles effects described by some effect interface, M of A, and it yields uh, a, a new um, computation, which here is M prime, A prime. Um, so these handle, handle functions um, should also compose, it should be possible to apply uh, handlers that handle a subset of effects first and then apply a handler that handles a different subset of effects afterwards. And this composition of handlers is not in general commutative and associative. Um, but this is a feature, not a bug, of, uh, of algebraic effects. So this is a, uh, these are some of the properties that algebraic effects have. Another very nice effect that algebraic effects have, and which we will be paying particular focus to in this talk, is that the same effect interface can be given an overloaded semantics. So that means that here I've written a handle function which handles uh, again an M of A. So we can think of this as the same set of effects that is being handled up here, but now I'm assigning a different meaning to it. I'm assigning an M hat prime and an A hat prime as the interpretation of this set of effects. So I can overload the semantics of effects and that is a, a very nice property of, of uh, algebraic effects. That's useful, for example, for defining an abstract interpreter. Um, this handle operation up here could be a a concrete interpreter and this handle operation down here could be an abstract interpreter. However, uh, the problem that, um, that we essentially address in this work is that overloadable semantics of effect interfaces only works for some effects. Um, and the solution that we present or propose in our short paper to this problem is latent effects and handlers. Um, so I'll be saying more about, um, yeah, uh, so overloading only works for some effects. Uh, so, so to illustrate the kinds of effects that it works well for, well, it works well for the state effects that, we, that we've seen uh, that I, I showed you uh, earlier, but it doesn't work for the function effects that I had on my initial slide. And it doesn't even work for, for this lead bind uh, effect here. So let bind here being, uh, we, we have a name. Um, well, we, we bind a name to this value and then we scope this computation in here by the binding of this name to this value. If we want to overload the semantics of let binding, we are constrained if we use plain algebraic effects uh, when we define, um, when we uh, yeah, assign meaning, when we define the handler for let bind. The good news is that the, actually um, in previous work, um, people have looked at how can we lift this restriction. So in previous work by uh, Nick Wu uh, et al. And, and by P. Rock et al., they introduced the notion of scoped effects and handlers, which allows us to, um, to assign this overloadable semantics to lead bindings, because these are, this is essentially an example of a scoped effects. However, what we observe in our, our short paper is that this doesn't really, doesn't work for functions. So functions um, essentially postpone evaluation of, of computations in a way that differs from uh, how scoping constructs such as, as let work. And that is then the problem that we address with the abstraction that we propose in the short paper, uh, namely latent effects uh, and handlers. Okay, so that's, that is uh, essentially the setup. That is the problem that, that we address in this work. So the takeaways from this talk 
uh, is that latent effects and handlers, they um, are like algebraic effects. They, they give a commutative associative um, semantics for composing effect interfaces. And the goal of the abstraction that our short paper is about is to support overloaded handlers. That is, we can assign different meanings to the same set of effects for a broader class of effects. Uh, so that's what I illustrate here by these arrows is assigning different uh, interpretations to the same set of effects. Um, and this, the class of effects that we want to support is well functions. So for example, we might want to, uh, to interpret uh, the, the function interface that I have on the slide up here um, as having a, um, an evaluation strategy that is uh, eager, call by value, or one that is, that is lazy, uh, call by name or call by need. Uh, and we also want to do staging constructs. Um, so uh, the staging that was in the name was referring to a different kind of staging, but we would like to also define the semantics of staging uh, in terms of algebraic effects in a way that we can overload um, and give an overloaded interpretation of, um, of the handlers for, for the uh, effects. And, uh, and more. In the rest of this talk, I will uh, first give an introduction to algebraic effects and handlers, um, try to illustrate what they are and, and how they work um, for people who aren't familiar. Um, and then I'll give it a, a brief introduction to how latent effects work and how they, um, they generalize um, algebraic effects. Uh, and I will look at, so since writing the short paper, we have continued working on, on this abstraction. Um, and I will talk a bit about what's to come and what's in the pipeline for, for latent effects and handlers. All of this is available at the URL at the bottom of, of all of the code that I'll be talking about in this talk and all of the code that is in our short paper is available at the URL at the bottom of the slide. It's implemented in ACTA. Uh, so uh, I am using ACTA as a meta language here. I'm not assuming that you are very familiar with ACTA, however, uh, it should be possible to read these signatures without being an ACTA expert. Um, but if you do have questions, I would encourage you to just ask questions during the talk. I'm also happy to take questions after. Okay, so uh, an introduction to uh, algebraic effects. Um, so I've, as, as mentioned earlier, the goal of uh, algebraic effects is to um, first define an interface of the effects that we will, that we want to um, have in our effectful language. Um, and so here is the type of, of an effect interface as we have implemented it in ACTA. We have a put operation, which uh, for now, Please ignore this bit. I'll talk about that in a bit. Put operation, which takes a natural number, and then it returns a, a type tree, uh, which is parameterized by a sigma. So sigma here is a signature of effectful operations. And what this constraint here, what this first bit in these uh, funny curly braces says, is that the state operation is a sub effect of, of the set of effects that this uh, computation here has. Okay, so tree says it's a, it's a computation that consists of operations described by the signature sigma. And the put operation returns a value. So that's the final bit of the signature. The value here is top, which in ACTA is the unit type. Okay, so put is an operation, takes a natural number, returns unit. Get is an operation, uh, which doesn't take any arguments uh, and but it, is, it represents an obligation to return a natural number. And what, these effect, what this effect interface essentially does is it allows us to construct effect trees. It allows us to construct a syntactic representation of, um, of, a, um, of a program involving the sets of um, effects that, that Sigma describes. So an effectful program is a tree of effectful operation operations given by an effect interface 
So here I have a program P, which um, has uh, effects that are either described by state or described by none. So here none is a, an effect interface that doesn't contain any operations, uh, but there's a reason why I formulated it in this way. And that's because when the time comes to define a handler in a bit, um, the handler will expect my tree type to have this form. The program that I've written here is a very silly little program. Uh, it puts zero into the current store, and then we get the contents of the current store. We put into the, I call it a store, it's really a stateful reference cell. Uh, we put into the stateful reference cell a value, well, the value that we just got from the store and add one to it, and then we get the results. So this is essentially just incrementing zero by one, this program. Um, so this is how we can define an effect interface, how we can write a program over it. Um, what remains to be done is now we need to define a handler for these um, state effects that I've just introduced. And we can do that by defining a function handle state, which takes a, a tree of operations as input. Um, then it takes an initial value for the state and it returns a new tree, which, so here, before we call handle state, we have at least the state effects inside of, uh, as, as operations in our tree. And what we essentially do is we handle all of these state effects to end up with a tree that only has the operations described by sigma left in it. Furthermore, before calling handle state, the return type is A. After calling handle state, the return type is um, a natural number and a. So this is the state of the final, the final state of the reference cell. And now um, we can hand, we can uh, apply this function. I'm not showing its uh, its implementation, um, but I'll talk a bit about how we actually encoded this in Acta later in the talk. Um, we can apply this handler to our program to uh, validate that indeed this program yields the result one as we would expect. It increments zero by one. Um, so that was a, a very simple application of, of an effect handler. We can also uh, have programs that have more kinds of effects in it. So for example, if we define a new effect interface for a read line effect, a read line operation, which represents an application to read in a natural number from a user, uh, then we can write a program involving this. So here's a, a variant of the program I had before. This program is called Q now. Uh, I still put zero as the first thing, then I get the result of the reference cell, store this in V0. Then I read in a value from the user. And then I put the result of adding V0, the state of the reference cell, together with the number that I got from the user. And finally, I return the result. Uh, if I now call my, my handler on this program, what I essentially do, what a handler does is what we, how we can model the semantics of algebraic effects is um, that we can think of this as, as computing a residual tree where we have handled all of the nodes that, the, um, that correspond to the effects described by the state interface. So over here, the residual program that I end up with, with uh, after applying handle state to Q is the program where um, I still have the read line operation left in my program because uh, handle state doesn't know how to interpret that. And then as, as the final result that I, I return over here, I uh, return a pair of two things. The first thing is the state of the final reference cell. And the second thing is the return type of the program or the return value of the program. In this case, they're the same because the final thing I do in my program is a get. Okay, so that's algebraic effects. This is how you can implement them in ACTA um, or how they work at least. Uh, the challenge is now to define function abstraction as an algebraic effect. And I see that uh, I may have to speed up a little bit. Um, the challenge is to implement this effect interface here uh, in terms of algebraic effects. So here I have um, uh, the apps operation from before, which takes a name 
and a computation as the body of the function, and it constructs the computation which returns a value, the value that it returns should be a closure value representing the function that we've constructed. Um, then we have a, a fetch operation for just looking at a, a variable. We have the apply for well applying a function. Um, as an example of a program that I could write using this is this program that I wrote down here. We put zero as the first thing in our program. This program involves both states, um, state effects and function effects. So first I put zero and then I construct a function abstraction which binds an X, uh, actually it ignores the X and then it just gets the state of the reference cell. Um, then I, uh, I put one into the stateful reference cell and I apply the function F to uh, just a unit value. And well, um, with a, a plain semantics, I would expect um, this program to, um, to yield the result one. Um, but actually, there are, there are two ways of weaving state through this program. Um, one is to, um, one is to in indeed do the thing that you would expect in, in, uh, in many uh, functional languages, which don't do evaluation on the lambdas. And, and that would cause this program to re return one. But we could also eagerly apply the state handler under the abstractions. We could do evaluation on the lambdas. And, and the goal of latent effects is to allow both interpretations. We want to allow both interpretations. Uh, we can eagerly apply the state handler under ab uh, abstraction. We can actually implement this with, with plain algebraic effects. It's, it's not very hard. I have an illustration, a long list of slides here, which illustrates how we can do that. In the interest of time, I think I will skip over this. And if anyone really wants to see it, we can return to it. Um, so so we, can, we can do this. Uh, we can e eagerly apply the state handler under the abstraction uh, using plain algebraic effects. If we want to lazily apply the state handler when a function call is evaluated. So essentially, if we want to have the, the usual interpretation of, um, of state, assuming that we first apply the state handler and subsequently apply the function, uh, then we have to somehow, we have to somehow remember what the state of the world is um, at the time we um, at the time we call apply and we have to somehow when we invoke an abstraction we have to know that the abstraction expects to be passed a store and we have to pass the store that the apply node has seen when the handle state was applied to that particular node in the tree Um, so in, if, if we want to do this with, with plain algebraic effects, we have to, um, at least, uh, the, the obvious way of doing this is to uh, essentially change the funk, um, funk, um, effect to, um, to allow us to, to do this kind of thing. Uh, and this is quite, quite messy. This is non-modular. We don't want to be, have to change our effects to change, to, to overload handlers for effects. So what latent effects do is they essentially generalize this pattern here. Uh, they allow us to remember the latent effects that we have seen at different nodes. And uh, I'll, I'll now talk about uh, the solution. So in latent effect trees, each node is associated with a latent effect state. Um, where the latent effect state is essentially the effects that previous handlers that were applied to the tree, they, uh, when we interpret, uh, when we apply the handler, they, they, the handler itself has some side effects. And if we want to overload the semantics of, um, of funk, we have to remember uh, what these effects are. And that is essentially what latent effect trees allow us to do. So the latent effect state is going to be given by a functor, L. Um, and this L, we're going to augment our tree type uh, by this L. So now we know what set of 
effects, uh, what set of latent effects each node in our tree is going to be associated with. So handle state, what that does is it essentially, it, it, um, it, it threads, uh, there's a, a, an extra parameter missing here. There also needs to be a natural number. It's, it threads a natural number through our, our um, effect tree in a stateful way. So while, after applying handle state, what we want to remember is that uh, in addition to the latent effects that were already in the tree, we also want to remember what was the natural number that the given node in the effect tree has seen. So um, what is the, the state of the natural number at each node in the tree? Uh, that is the idea. Uh, so now let's look at how, how does this actually work in effect trees, uh, latent effect trees. This is the same program that I had before. We put zero, we have a function which gets the state of the reference cell. We put one and we apply F to a unit value. Uh, this is the program where we've now changed from plain algebraic effects trees to latent effect trees. So here I start out with a tree which has the identity function because we have not applied any handlers to this tree yet, meaning there are no latent effects in the tree. And at each node, I remember um, I apply this latent effect functor to just the unit value. So initially I associate just a, an extra unit value with each node in the tree. Furthermore, the body of the lambda abstraction expects to be passed a latent effect, um, an application of the latent effect functor to the unit value, which I can then associate with the node that is stored inside of the abstraction. So this essentially allows me to um, allows us to um, parameterize subcomputations of effects by a, a set of latent effects. Um, okay, so this is the tree before we apply the handle state function. Now let's look at when we apply the handle state function. Well, we are now in the process of handling the state effect. So I'll indicate that by this strike through guy here. Um, so um, the signature has changed. I now need to remember what the state of the reference cell is at each node in the tree. And what you can see here is that now I don't just have a, a plain unit value here. I actually remember what's the state of the reference cell at each node. Initially, the reference cell is zero, assuming I've called handle state with zero as the initial value. And then I return not just a plain value, but actually a value wrapped in this latent effect function. And then the next node in the tree is parameterized by the latent effect from the, the previous monadic bind. Um, so in this way, each node now is aware of what latent effect context it's going to be evaluated in, meaning that if I apply the state handler, I'm going to end up with a residual tree, which now remembers that the apply node is supposed to be evaluated or can be evaluated under the latent effects, where one is the state of the reference cell, um, but we could also choose to say, well, the abstraction should eagerly evaluate. It should pass to L, this zero here, um, at the state of, of the apps. So essentially, we can overload this, the interpretation of, of uh, the handlers for, for this tree type here. That is the idea. Um, I here have the actual actor type that we implemented. Uh, I see that there's very little time left. So I think that I will um, skip over these and you can ask me about them if, you're, if you'd like to see them. Um, in ongoing work, we're, we're working on showing that the tree type for latent effects is actually a free monad. This is something that's left us an open question in this short paper. Uh, we're looking at implementing a lazy evaluation strategy for the funk effect interface. Um, in the paper, there's an eager evaluation strategy for it. Um, and the effect handlers that are in the paper are, are shallow effect handlers um, that are not expressed in terms of a fold over the, the tree. And we're looking at how can we actually uh, get deep effect handlers expressed as, as folds over trees. And finally, we're, we're also looking at staging uh, a la MetaML or template Haskell as an effect. Uh, that's what I had. Uh, so. 
these are the takeaways I summarized earlier. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Petra. Is my mic working now? I think it might be. Um, uh, we can hear you. You're quite quiet. I'm quite quiet. Let me move my mic a little closer. Um, and then maybe we could start by um, applauding. Um, thanks very much, Petra. <laughs> Um, so are there any questions? Um, I think as before, if there are, you can just um, speak, out. speak out. I have a question, if no one else is volunteering. Um, have you, you, I mean, you talked about algebraic effects. Have you considered how equations might fit into this picture? Uh, that is a good question. So the short answer is we haven't yet. Um, but uh, it is something that, well, we stated as, as future work in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the paper, but it's not something that we, have, we haven't looked at yet. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, Jeremy, I'm seeing questions in the chat. Ah, oh, right, let me um, take a look at those. Um, there's a question from Ohad, um, which, Oh, Ohad, would you like to go ahead? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so it's a bit of a long question. Um, so if you look at the fun function handler or function behavior, there's a different way to, to implement it, right? Which is we first handle abst, only abst. Inside it, we handle the continuation replacing the get, the thanked effects get by thanked get. Then we handle the result of this handler by whatever you want to do with the, with the effects, say the state handler. And then we're renaming the thanked get back to get. And that should implement the behavior you wanted uh, because the, the thanked effects stay thanked uh, and stay there and everything else gets evaluated. Now, I'm, okay. this is a bit ugly, but it's still modular in the way that you want it to be, right? So. It's modular in can terms I, of, of abst. So, so what am I missing? And, and make sure that I understand the question. You're saying um, abs takes the continuation and uses that as the body of the function? Was that what you were saying? You, well, abs handles the gets in the body in, in the continuation, renaming them so they kind of go through the state handler, okay? And then you use the state handler to evaluate the state calls, and then you, you rename the thunk state calls back to uh, uh, um, back to what they were before, back to gets. Right. And and it's still modular in the in the concepts you want it to be modular, right? It's it's only operating at the level of abst and the thanked operations. It's a bit messy, right? But I'm not introducing a new kind of handler, right? So so I'm I'm guessing I'm missing something, right? That I'm missing the problem with it. And so so what what is this not solving? Yeah, so um, my reservation with, with that proposal would be that, um, so how do you know which effects need to be renamed? Is, is that all of the effects that are in the, um, in the body? I mean, you have to the, choose that, right? You have to choose which ones need to be renamed. You have to choose which ones are thunk and which ones are not. So, so that needs to be, the solution needs to have a, a handle on which ones get, you know, get thunk and which ones don't, so, so that means a modular solution can access them. Uh, and, and so this one does. Uh, so, so it's still operating within the rules. Right. So, okay, so this would be adding, adding some extra structure to, um, to, the, um, to the notion of effects, which, which requires you to then distinguish what are the thunk computations, what are not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of a difficult awesome. online question. Yeah, yeah, we can continue offline. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I suppose it was more than a comment. It's an interesting comment. It's not, it's not something that I had uh, I had thought about. Uh, okay. The, the honest. So, um, but it's it's interesting. Um, so I would be interested in discussing that more offline. Okay, I'll, I'll pin I'll pin the channel so we can continue, kind of gradually okay. during the week. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Okay, with a little regret, I am going to suggest that we uh, leave things there because time is running short. Um, but before we end, uh, let's thank Casper once again.
just hear your slides available. Ah, great. There we go. Everyone see? Uh, yes. Yes. Great. Um, so um, I'll, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce our next speaker from the University of Edinburgh. Um, Jesse is going to um, tell us about two very exciting things and how to combine them. Um, so, of course, uh, program transformation is something that's generally very interesting to the PEPM community. And um, a particular type of program transformation, automatic differentiation, is also quite popular at the moment. Um, it's apparently useful in machine learning, which uh, some other people are working on. Um, effects, of course, and handlers tie in um, both with Pepin's interests and with the previous talks. And uh, Jesse's going to tell us how to combine these things. Um, over to you, Jesse. Thanks for the introduction. And hopefully, this won't go <laughs> over time. Uh, but we'll see. So uh, yes, uh, a quick summary is um, automatic differentiation is an important family of algorithms which enables derivative calculation and in particular derivative based optimization. Uh, I'm gonna show here that AD can be simply implemented with effects and handlers by doing so in the Frank language. So this will be a uh, presentation by uh, proof of existence of a program. So there'll be a good bit of code and example uh, evaluation and hopefully not too much. So as a quick aside uh, for automatic differentiation, um, I, I really wanna focus on the structure of the uh, program transformations and how uh, continuations are captured and delimited and stuff. So I'm not gonna go and uh, prove the math, but just as a, a quick intuition on how all of these algorithms sort of work is they each sort of work uh, incrementally by using the chain rule and the, the compositionality of it to basically calculate the entire derivative of a program by uh, incrementally doing it one basic operation at a time. Um, and I try to show this um, common structure between all of the handlers, which uh, I show today. Um, but again, I won't, I won't justify the math, but uh, it's all correct, thankfully. Um, so there's, there's two main categories of automatic differentiation. One is called forward mode and one is called reverse mode. And in fact, these modes are uh, extrema on a whole spectrum. Um, and we'll, we'll see later why uh, one's called forward and one's called reverse. Um, and hopefully it will make sense when we see it. Um, so one reason why there are these uh, two well-known modes on the extreme is because um, if your program has n, n inputs and m outputs, then forward mode will be on and reverse mode will be om. So depending on the dimensionality of your inputs and outputs, one of these will uh, almost certainly be more desirable. Um, in general, if n is close to m, you can't decide, but often you can figure out which one might be better. So let's have a quick introduction to Frank. So Frank makes some uh, opinionated design choices. So I'll, I'll go through uh, some, some things about Frank. Um, so it's a strict functional programming language with effect and handlers. Um, the evaluation order is left to right. Um, it's inspired uh, by call by push value, which means there's a distinction between uh, values and computations. And so whenever you see um, something enclosed in braces, either at the type level or the term level, that means it's a computation. So Frank uh, decides to unify uh, functions and handlers and calls them uh, operators. Um, but we can, uh, we'll sometimes say handler, we'll sometimes say function, uh, but in Frank, they're one and the same and they each act by application. Um, Frank, Frank's handlers are shallow. Um, I personally think shallow handlers are a little bit more flexible. Uh, shallow and deep handlers can be inter-expressed up to some administrative reductions. Um, and I think specifically, we'll, uh, I think there's some arguments to say that shallow handlers may be a little bit better for AD in some cases, um, because sometimes you want a little bit more flexibility on how you interpret things, but um, that's, that's more speculative than anything. Um, finally, uh, Frank uh, decides instead of often you see uh, requirements being propagated outwards in Frank, they're propagated inwards and we shall see an example of that right now. So here's some example Frank code. So essentially this is an implementation of the state monad sort of thing where we have two operations, uh, effectual operations get and put, but we're sort of gonna instrument it with also uh, printing get put end or start depending on what we're doing with the handler. So let's uh, analyze uh, this handler slash function. So first we see that the calling context must support the ability, which is the singleton list containing console, which I've highlighted here. 
And what it is, it's a snock list. So the head is on the right, uh, containing exactly one instance council of the interface council, which is a built-in effect, which means it's going to be handled by the runtime. Um, and so you can have multiple instances, which we'll see of the same interface, but in this case, we just have one. So the ability council means that we can use the command, which is an effectual operation, uh, print, uh, which is defined by the interface council. And we can use that in the right-hand side definition of state. Um, and what this also means is that the first argument uh, to state uh, can only be computed using commands um, from, the, uh, from the ambient ability council um, up to some hidden polymorphism here. Uh, and so we can see here when we call state that we can also have start as the first one. Uh, but more interestingly, in the, in the second argument, not only uh, can that arrive uh, using uh, council commands, but it can also arrive using state commands. And the, the reason for that is because uh, in the type signature for the second argument, we have these uh, uh, bracket things. And what that is, it's an adjustment to the ambient ability, which adds state to it. So we can see here that in the second argument, we can use get and put. Um, and as a quick comment, the exclamation mark is nullary function application or thunk forcing, however you want to see it. So that's the short, quick introduction to Frank. Um, we'll go through and do some example evaluations for the handlers, uh, which I'm going to introduce. So I'm going to introduce four handlers. Uh, the simplest one uh, is going to be our top level one. Uh, and that's just going to dispatch all of our arithmetic to the built-in functions. Uh, diff is going to be the implementation of forward mode, reverse the implementation of reverse mode, and reverse C is a uh, checkpointed reverse mode, which we'll talk about later. And that basically allows you to do a time space trade-off uh, of reverse mode. Um, and that's probably our most interesting example, and hopefully we have enough time to get to that and still explain it well. So before we get going, there's a few auxiliary definitions which I have to get out of the way. First is we actually need to define our effect. So this is how we define an effect in Frank. So we have an interface of smooth functions of our arithmetic functions. Um, so we have three different types. We have nullary functions, unary functions, and binary functions. Uh, we have plus and times for the binary functions negate for the unary function and constants for the nullary function. Here I've used int because that's what Frank already has, but you could replace this with floats or doubles or whatever you want. But for now we just use ints. Um, in order to make everything more readable, I define these helper functions, which are basically just synonyms for um, constants, negation, plus, and times. And as far as the operational semantics, uh, Frank is concerned, it really doesn't matter. We can pretend that these are uh, commands themselves. Um, so in order to aid the um, apparent structure and similarities and differences of the handlers, which I'll define, um, I have uh, this family of functions called op012, uh, which just implement plus times negate constant. And additionally, I do the same for derivatives. Um, and these are hopefully derivatives you've seen before. Um, so for unary functions, there's one derivative, and for uh, binary functions, there's two derivatives, one with respect to the left argument, one with respect to the right argument, and I've written out the mathematical versions of them off to the side. So hopefully everyone's seen them before, um, and these two sets of families of functions combined will help us see the similarities and differences between the handlers, which I will show. To begin with, though, we don't see uh, that second class of auxiliary functions, we just see the evaluate handler. Uh, this is going to be our top level handler, as I mentioned before. And what this will do is this will remove all smooth effects and uh, bring us back to a pure program. And this is the definition. So we can see here that it handles the smooth effects. Um, and what we see is um, when we hit uh, an effect, which is a smooth effect, uh, we take the captured continuation K and to the captured continuation K, we just feed the uh, evaluation using the built-in arithmetic functions back into the continuation and continue as normal. So this is the, the simplest thing. So let's do some uh, example evaluations to see how Frank works. So let's evaluate the following expression, one plus x cubed plus minus x squared. And we're going to evaluate that at x equals two and y equals four. So I've written that out here and I've substituted in um, x and y already. Uh, we could just have easily had a let expression and it doesn't really make any difference. 
Um, so let's start evaluating it. So for the left to right evaluation, first thing we need to evaluate is this command C1, which stands for the constant one. So what happens? Well, it's an effectual command, so we need to handle it. So how do we begin to handle it? Well, what we do is we begin to freeze the context stack in order to capture a delimited continuation. And so we start capturing uh, the command itself, and then we see it's an argument to the plus. So we capture the whole plus. And what we see now is we have the command C1, and it's a command which corresponds to the smooth uh, effect interface, and evaluate says that it'll handle, it, handle that. And so what happens is we have hit one of the defining equations for evaluate. So what happens now? Well, what happens is the variables i and k in the left-hand side of the definition are going to be bound. i is going to be bound to one since c uh, is passed a one and that just uh, corresponds to the i in app zero const e i. And how does k get bound? Well, the way that k gets bound is we take the entire highlighted expression. We see where the command which we wanted to handle was. We take it away, we put a fresh variable x, and we make that into one thunk with x as the new value. So we can see here, it's exactly the same as the above, except we have an x where the command was, and we have uh, um, used the definition of this equation of evaluate on the right-hand side, and now we have evaluate of that continuation applied to one. So if we just apply that function, continuation, well, now what we have is uh, we have a actual integer one in the place where we had the effectual command before. So if we keep doing this, uh, the next left to right evaluation that we need to do is two times two or e two two. So we do the same thing. We begin to capture and we capture and we capture. And now we have our delimited continuation again, which is delimited by evaluate. So we do the same thing. We replace uh, the command, which we wanted to handle with a new variable. And that's our continuation, which we've captured, and it gets substituted in to the defining equation of evaluate. And we multiply two times two with the built-in arithmetic operations and continue. And once more, and now we have four where we had t22 before. So I won't have us go through all of it. If we keep going, we'll eventually get minus seven. So that's our most basic handler, and that's going to be what causes our programs to become pure again. Let's look at a slightly more complicated handler, the diff handler, which implements forward mode differentiation. So here, the first thing we do is define a helper data type called dual. And what is dual? Well, dual is a pair of values. And the first value is going to be the actual value of the computation which we care about. And the second one is going to be its derivative. And so what we'll see in the definition of diff is we just perform the, the operation which we care about for the first component. And then we do something equivalent to the chain rule at each step for the second component, which is this compositional incremental computation I was mentioning before. So we handle an operation. Uh, what do we calculate? Well, the first thing that we calculate is the actual value. So we just dispatch off to this op, so op zero, op one, op two, for the uh, proper, um, the proper um, arithmetic uh, operation we care about. Then we do the derivative. So we see that we have dx times derivative of something. We have dx times the derivative of something, y times the derivative of something, then we add those together. You can take my word for it. This is the chain rule thing, which I was talking about. But we can see here that they, they both happen together. And uh, those are both going to be handled by this um, smooth instance here in the ambient ability. And then what happens after all of those are calculated? Well, we continue on with the execution. So the reason why this is called forward mode is because the direction of the program execution stays in the forward direction. And we'll contrast that in a, with the uh, reversed control flow in some sense, which we will see for the reverse handler. So let's do an example execution. So we'll execute uh, the same mathematical term uh, at the same point, And we're gonna differentiate it with respect to x, which means the derivative should be the derivative of x cubed, which is three x squared. And we're gonna, that's also going to be evaluated at the same point where x is. So at, at x equals two, that's three times two times two is 12. So we should expect to have a 12 somewhere in the very end. So I've substituted the values in. Um, 
And so usually we would have some sort of helper function and the actual um, uh, term um, one plus x to the third plus minus y squared would be polymorphic with respect to um, uh, smooth x. Uh, but in this case, I've just substituted um, something in uh, to help evaluate it. And what we see here is for x equals two, we've put some ones next to it and that represents the fact that we're differentiating with respect to x. And for y, we put some zeros. And mathematically, this is what is required. And we do actually introduce a helper function later on, which will do some of this for us automatically. So if we start evaluating, we need to capture a continuation for this uh, command C1 as before. So we capture it. But now instead of evaluate handling it, we have a handler diff, which is uh, the delimiting handler. So it's the closer one. And so diff handles it. So this is the substitution of diff in. So we have this top line here where we do the actual operation and its derivative. And here's the capture continuation with the X where the command was. So if we evaluate that, we have a one, a C one and a C zero. And now both of these are now delimited by evaluate when we capture continuation associated with them and not by diff. So they will just turn into the integers one and zero. And after those get substituted in, these get substituted in for R down here, which is passed in the continuation. So dual one zero is where X was, which was here. So that's the first step. And the next step is going to continue similarly. So it's, it's not all that different from the evaluate handler. And you could accomplish this in another language through something as simple as uh, operator overloading or like a, a virtual method lookup or something like that. But the point is it's still easy and natural to implement with handlers. And so if we keep evaluating this, well, what do we end up with? Well, we end up minus seven as we had before, but in the second component, we have 12, which is our derivative. Now, this is building up to our uh, more interesting comments on effect systems and how they can help us with AD, which is what we're gonna talk about here. So Frank and effect handlers in general uh, have this nice property where we can statically guarantee based on the types that a command will be handled, but we can dynamically choose what handles it. So something which can help us with this, this isn't the only method for uh, dynamically choosing handlers and stuff, um, are these things called adapters, which is what I've highlighted in red here. And so what I've done here is I've defined an auxiliary function P, which will give us the derivative of the function we feed into it. And in order to nest this D, we need to tell Frank exactly how we want to thread our effects through the effect type system in order for the correct handler to handle it. So say I want to calculate this derivative here. So I have a derivative with respect to x and a derivative with respect to y, and this should equal one. And in fact, if anyone here is familiar with AD, this is a common test to make sure that your system isn't confusing things. And the way that uh, Frank stops us from confusing things is in order for the equivalent expression, which I've just shown to type check, we actually need this lift right here. If this lift is elided, the function doesn't type check. And actually there's no other valid place to put this lift. Whereas in some other systems, for example, um, in some to Haskell implementations that you might do off the cuff using dual numbers in a similar way, you could put the lift in a different space and have it type check, it would produce some other value besides one, which is not the mathematically um, desired answer. And so the, the effect system actually helps us here and forces us to give, or forces us to put lift in the mathematically sensical place. So if we evaluate this a few steps, so C1 is handled by the evaluate, and we apply the function. Now we see here, once we've substituted the definition of D, we have the C1 here and in front of the C1 is this smooth adapter. And what this effect, uh, what this does is instead of the C1 delimited by the innermost handler, if the smooth basically says, skip the innermost handler and go to the one above that. And so now the C1 is handled by evaluate. So here we've somehow dynamically chosen what we want uh, 
you handle this C1. And in fact, without this, it wouldn't check. We'll see later uh, other ways which you can dynamically choose handlers for what you're executing. So let me check the time real quick. Okay. So now we've moved on to our first more interesting example of a handler, and that's the reverse mode handler. So again, we have to define an auxiliary data type. And what is this auxiliary data type? Well, it's, a, it's two things. The first one is, as before, the value which we want to calculate. But the second one is going to be a stateful cell, which we are going to update as the computation goes on. And so it'll initially start off as zero. As it goes, it'll accumulate more and more values through addition. And at the end of the computation, it'll contain the derivative of the value it's paired with. So let's look at what the reverse mode handler does. So for the handled operation, the first thing it does is similar to the forward mode, is it just calculates the uh, value which we need using the op functions. But all it does for the derivative is it just makes some space for it and sets it to zero and waits for it to be updated. So after that, the, so, oh, and also these continue, uh, these uh, um, operations as before is handled by this ambient ability smooth. And now the execution continues, but we can see that after we call the continuation, there's still more code to run. And so what happens is after our whole program, which we'll see as we go through an example evaluation, after our original program runs, we're going to end up with an ancillary program, which accumulates all of our derivatives. And this is what the back propagation is. We're going to propagate some information backwards with respect to the original control flow. And we'll see how um, Frank's operational semantics and this handler um, show us what this reverse control flow really means. And so we can see here, uh, I say propagated backwards by accumulation is because these dx's and dy's are actually references to stateful cells. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write to them and we're going to accumulate them with these pluses. So what we're really doing here, even though it's a little bit hard to visually parse, is we're taking stateful cell and we're adding something to it as we go. So we need a little bit of help to set everything up to make sure it works. And this is sort of similar to the handler that we just saw is we need this grad function, which stands for gradient to make sure that everything sets up. So if we wanna calculate the gradient or the derivative of this function f, well, the first thing we need to do is make space for its final derivative, just as we've been making space for derivatives before. We're just going to evaluate the function. We're going to make sure that when we evaluate the function, all of its um, all of its smooth effects are going to be handled this reverse here. And we're going to initialize uh, its derivative to one. And the reason why we're going to initialize its derivative to one is because it is the um, unit for multiplication. And so when we multiply things with the chain rule, the one means we're starting off okay. Um, and then we're going to return the calculated derivative. But let's see how this actually works. So we're doing the same expression before, it's still x cubed, uh, one plus x cubed plus minus y squared. And here I've said y equals c4. Um, now, if I substituted the c4 twice here, um, instead of having a let, uh, technically we would have a different execution. For the purposes of automatic differentiation, it doesn't matter. You could observe the difference, but for our purposes, it's immaterial. So we start evaluating. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker because I'm running a bit low on time. But we start folding the definitions and evaluating things and get to the point where we see something somewhat similar. So where we have the constant one, we have an actual one, and some reference cell, which is what I mean by these angled brackets here. We have two times two, and we have some, some more references, et cetera, et cetera. And we have four paired with some more references. And all of these are going to be initialized to zero. And now we hit the first interesting case of the reverse derivative handler. We need to handle the factual multiplication. So first we need to capture the, the, the continuation, which is delimited by reverse, so that's good. And then what happens is this continuation, um, Is, is captured and the result of the uh, multiplication of two times two is four, which is our four here. So I've substituted it in already. And we've also allocated yet another spot for a derivative, R3. And what we see here is that this, this new R3 
something we're going to read from later in the program over here. And what are we going to do with that R3 is we're going to add that into the Z, Z reference. And the Z reference is what we're going to get at the end of the program. So if we keep doing this, we end up with something that looks like this. And what's, what's happened is, <laughs> I've skipped forward a lot, obviously. What's, what's happened here is we've, we've executed through all the arithmetic, and we've basically accrued a list of writes, which we need to do. And this list of writes, which all appeared after we continued the continuation in the definition of the reverse handler, is exactly what the back propagation is all about. So why is this called reverse mode and why is it back propagation? Well, what we can see is that we look at the far right hand side and we look at all these references. It goes R8, R7, R6, 5, 4, 3. Well, R8 was the one which was most recently defined, and R3 was defined way earlier in the program. So instead of the control flow going from 3 to 8, it goes from 8 to 3. And so that's why it's called reverse mode. And this is what people mean when they say it reverses the order of the control flow. And you could do this with a non-local program transformation in some other systems, and you would actually need to do some control flow analysis and in some more real sense, reverse the flow. In our case, what we've done is we've accumulated a whole bunch of writes, and in the end, it does the correct thing. So we can also see here that um, the memory usage, the number of references which we need, is going to be linear with respect to the number of times we hit the reverse handler. And the number of times we hit the reverse handler is proportional to the number of arithmetic operations that we require to evaluate. So what happens if that's too much memory? Well, that's what checkpointed reverse mode is for. So here's a diagram to get some intuition, which I've adapted. And on the left-hand side is the reverse mode handler. And on the right-hand side is the checkpointed reverse mode handler. And what we're doing is a time-space trade-off. So we can see here, um, for this dotted line, we're allocating memory, allocating memory, allocating memory, allocating memory. And then we hit this dotted line, which corresponds to this slide back here which is the last time we see reverse before reverse disappears, is this dotted line. And then after that, we start you know, writing to memory, writing to memory, writing to memory, and then we can start freeing memory, which we no longer uh, have any references to. What checkpointed reverse mode does is basically it says, okay, you know, we need to calculate this, this checkpointed bit of our program C. But you know, okay, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run it multiple times. We're gonna essentially run it twice, once over here, and once over here, this, this forward and backward arrow, arrow sort of belong together. And what happens is we, we run it once without allocating any memory, and then we run it a second time and allocate memory. So let's look at a handler which does that. And so here's the reverse checkpointed handler. So we, we, we have a new um, checkpoint effect which holds a thunk. And this thunk is the, the checkpointed program C that I showed before, which is going to be run multiple times. And what happens? Well, when we hit a checkpoint a bit of our program, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate it as normal without allocating any memory, which is this evaluate T thing, which is very similar to our original evaluate handler. Um, so that runs normally without allocating any memory. And we're going to run the rest of the program. And then we're going to run the thunk again this time allocating memory in order to do the last back propagation step. And the interesting thing about this handler is even though it does something conceptually more complicated, um, and you might you might think that, oh no, we have to you know copy and paste the definition, um, thanks to uh, the way that Frank works is we can actually reuse the uh, original reverse mode handler. And that's what this M down here for. It's a, it's a catch-all that says if we hit anything besides checkpoint, which we're responsible for, which in this case is all the smooth effects, then you know, take this uh, captured uh, continuation and save it as a thunk. And then we use the thunk and we capture it and everything works out. And you'll notice here we have a lot more of this dynamic threading of effects with these adapters at the term level with the angle brackets in order for everything to work we've actually gotten compositionality and we've put reverse mode in checkpointed reverse mode, which is quite nice. So I don't think I have enough time to really talk about this that much, but we can see as we evaluate further, we eventually, uh, actually let's look at the original program. So in the original program, 
uh, we have a few checkpointed bits. And these are the bits that are going to be run multiple times. And if we evaluate through, what we end up with is we end up with um, bits of the program which need to be run multiple times. So this plus here was originally the first thing which we checkpointed. And there was another thing which we needed a checkpoint. And that checkpoint actually had another checkpoint inside of it. But everything here will just work out. And this is the, the nice thing about being able to dynamically uh, choose what handles what, is you can get this really complicated control flow. But with the guarantees of the static type system, you always know that everything's going to be handled. Um, so let's just talk real quick about the utility. Um, a priori, you don't often know if forward or reverse mode is going to be best. Shallow handlers uh, could dynamically change which mode you do as you execute, which would be quite nice. Um, nesting works relatively automatically. The type system uh, for effects has your back and will actually disallow more incorrect programs than some other type systems. Not necessarily all of them, but some of them. Um, and the implementation is, is, is quite succinct overall, as far as lines of code. Um, all the code that you need has been in the slides and is in the paper. There's no extra code except for the Frank uh, prelude, but that's just basic functions. So this is all of the code which you need. Um, so some extensions and comparisons. Um, so in Wang et al's demystifying differentiable programming um, shift reset, the penultimate back propagator, which is the inspiration for this work, uh, they also handle control flow constructs. Um, and we can do that in a similar way to them. Um, and they also do uh, staging. Um, and we could apply um, staging literature for effects to this as well and hopefully achieve something similar. Um, effects and handlers also have nice denotational semantics in terms of Levere theories, which are equivalent to finitary monads. And the, the Frank implementation gives ideas about how you could take some call by push value semantics and actually uh, give some nice semantics uh, in a call by push value style language um, notationally. Uh, and it also corresponds to some uh, well-studied mathematical objects. Um, finally, uh, we showed that um, we can find things relatively modularly in Frank, um, and there's uh, a lot of AD literature and a lot of variations. So hopefully, you know, some things can be uh, combined and bodged together. And uh, finally, uh, it's pretty simple to extend the system to work with vectors and matrices for efficiency sake in the style of diff sharp, if anyone's uh, familiar with that. Um, so in conclusion, facts and handlers make AD simple to, uh, simple to implement. Uh, the two reverse mode handlers effectively build up ancillary programs as they execute as a form of program manipulation. And finally, effect handlers allow a compositional approach to AD algorithms. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Jesse. Okay, we are a little over time, um, but we did start late. Oh, it would be a shame um, not to allow ourselves the luxury of at least one question. Um, so if you have a question, uh, make yourself and your question known. Yeah, I have a question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, once you introduce checkpointing, mm -hmm. is it the case that every continuation is invoked once or, or can they be invoked several times? Uh, so the continuation itself is invoked once. Um, the thunk itself, the, the thunk, um, which is passed to the checkpoint effect, is invoked multiple times. Um, but to, to reference something which was talked about in the last talk, um, theoretically there could be possibly a way to do this with um, scoped effects, and that might there might be an alternate um, implementation where the continuation is invoked multiple times. But in this one, it does not escape its scope, and it's only invoked once. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, I think we probably ought to stop there. Um, so let's thank uh, Jesse once again. All right, uh, I'm gonna just stop recording on YouTube.